Well, good morning. We are continuing our studies in the uh, ministry and life of the prophet Elisha. We're looking at 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm going to cover verses 1 through 37, but it's a lot to read. So I'm going to just read verses 8 through 17. But let me give you a quick summary of the passage. The first The passage deals with three acts of mercy. And the first has to do with a widow in verses 1 through 7 who is in debt and the creditor is at the door and she needs help immediately and appeals to Elisha for that. And he shows mercy. The second has to do with another woman. She is not a widow, but she doesn't have children as the first woman does, and, Lord, and uh, is, shows mercy to the prophet, and the prophet shows mercy to her. And then the third act of mercy, she's given a child, and the second, third act of mercy is mercy for that child and her. And we'll cover that at length in the, the lesson. Let me begin reading our text with the second woman in verse 8. Don't know her name. She's simply called the Shunammite. Now there came a day when Elisha passed over to Shunam, where there was a prominent woman, and she persuaded him to eat food. And so it was, as often as he passed by, he turned there in there to eat food. She said to her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God passing by us continually. Please, let us make a little walled upper chamber, and let us set a bed for him there, and a table and a chair and a lampstand, and it shall be when he comes to us that he can turn in there. One day he came there and turned into the upper chamber and rested. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. He said to him, say now to her, behold, you have been careful for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Would you be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the army? And she answered, I live among my own people. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, truly she has no son and her husband is old. He said, call her. When he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, at this season next year, you will embrace a son. And she said, No, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. The woman conceived and bore a son at that season the next year, as Elijah had said to her. That was the second act of mercy. The third, we will see, is even greater. Let's bow together in a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless this time of study and worship together. Lord. In Genesis 35, following one of the lowest points in Jacob's difficult life, the Lord told him to go up to Bethel and make an altar to him. And so Jacob told his sons, let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress. That's the God of Jacob. He is the God of Abraham and Isaac. He is the God of Isaiah and Jeremiah, the God of Peter and Paul, the God of Augustine, Luther, Calvin, Edwards, and Warfield. He is your God, the only God, God Almighty, the triune God, the infinite, eternal, and holy God, the personal God who loves His people and answers all of us in the day of our distress. 
What a blessing. What a glorious and gracious thing that He who is enthroned above the universe would stoop, condescend to come down to us to care for us and answer us in our time of need. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 37, there are three examples of the Lord doing that. Three examples of His mercy to His saints in the day of their distress. An example of what He does for each of us as we look to Him. Elisha was the great prophet of the day. And as his story continues, it clearly follows the pattern of his predecessor, Elijah, with miracles that were similar to those that Elijah did. In 1 Kings 17, at the beginning of Elijah's ministry, he daily provided oil and flour for a widow and her son during a severe famine. Then when the widow's son died, Elijah raised him from the dead. We see similar events here in 2 Kings 4, which served two purposes. First, to show that the Lord's hand was on Elisha, just as it was on Elijah, showing Elisha was a worthy successor to the great prophet. And second, that God supports those who fear Him. He answers us in the day of our distress. And He doesn't do it grudgingly, but gladly, He does it joyfully. He is, as Paul told the Corinthians, the God of all comfort. The first answer or miracle involved a widow whose husband had recently died. Some of the old rabbis identified him as Obadiah from 1 Kings 18, who had hidden a hundred prophets from the wicked queen Jezebel, saved their lives. According to Josephus, he had borrowed money to do that, to feed the prophets that he had put in hiding. That's a legend, it's speculation, but the man was a prophet living in the community of prophets, so he was a godly man. But upon his death, his wife and children had been left destitute and were facing a crisis. She came to Elisha for help. She reminded him that he knew her husband, knew he, as she said, feared the Lord, but she was in debt. And the creditor was coming for her children as payment on it. The creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. This was her day of distress, the actual day of it. She was desperate. But would God work through Elisha to help her as he had helped others through Elijah? The widow didn't doubt that he would. But still, this was a challenge for Elisha. He was in no doubt either. He asked what she had in her house. Nothing, she said, but a jar of oil. And actually, is smaller than that. What this was, was a flask used for anointing. Not much to work with. But it was enough. Elisha told her to borrow all the vessels she could from the neighbors, all the jars, all the, the containers. Do not get a few, he said. In other words, don't think... God can't answer big. He does. In fact, Paul reminds us of that in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. He is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. I think all of us probably think God does small things, not the big things. But no, He's able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. We see it here. She didn't question Him. She obeyed in every detail. Elisha told her to collect the neighbor's jars and 
behind closed doors began pouring the oil from her small flask into the many jars and bowls that she had collect, collected. The reason for doing this in private isn't stated with the doors shut, but it, it, it seems it was evidently to demonstrate that Elisha's presence wasn't necessary. You remember the, the, the man who came to Jesus and asked for help because of his, his sick and dying daughter, and he needed Jesus to be there. And that is the, the issue that some might have. We need the prophet there with us. He's got to be there in, it, in this room. And what Elisha was demonstrating is that, no, it's not necessary for me to be there because this is God's work. And, and so that is demonstrated here in that she's in there behind closed doors by herself with the prophet outside. The prophet does miracles, but they're the miracles that God does through him. The prophet was only his representative to the people. He had no knowledge to reveal or understanding or power to do miracles in and of himself is all of God. And her obedience to him in this regard showed her faith in that. The word used for pouring here is an intensive form of the word stressing an ongoing action. <clears throat> she kept pouring because she kept believing. She didn't stop until the flask ran out. Bring me another vessel, she said, until her son said, there is not one vessel more. And then it stopped. So just as the Lord uh, provided oil for the widow of Zarephath in Elijah's day, he provided for this widow and her children. God can do a lot with a little. He can do a lot with nothing. He made the universe out of nothing. Hebrews 11.3 states, we know that by faith. And when we know that, how great God is, that nothing is too difficult for Him, we will live by faith. Like this poor widow did. And experienced abundance beyond what she had even hoped for. The profits from the sale of the oil gave her enough to pay off all the family debts, to deliver her children from slavery, and far more. They had enough to live on. That was far more abundantly beyond all that she had asked for or even thought of. Not only were her children rescued from slavery, but the family was rescued from poverty. The Lord doesn't forget those who fear Him and those who serve Him. The great miracle, the next great miracle, uh, occurred for <clears throat> a woman who had no children, and he showed mercy to Elisha. She lived in Shunem. She's not named. She's known simply as the Shunammite. Shunem was in the Jezreel Valley in the central part of Israel, just south of Mount Carmel, where Elijah did his great miracle of calling down fire from heaven and his contest with the prophets of Baal. And that's where Elisha had his home. This valley, the Jezreel Valley, is... Uh, referred to in Israel today as ha Emek, the valley, because this is the breadbasket of Israel. It is a fertile valley with prosperous farms, and she was a prosperous person. She is described here as a prominent woman, a wealthy woman who clearly had keen insight in spiritual things. And such women are not common because such people are not common. Often wealth blinds them to the things of God. Now there are some exceptions to that. We see that throughout history. The Countess of Huntington comes to my mind. She was an 18th century English aristocrat who became a believer in Christ and, and as a result of that supported the ministries of George Whitfield and the Wesleys and of others. 
She was a remar remarkable woman uh, living in the upper class, and she would invite so many of the, the prominent people of that day, the aristocrats, to her home where they would hear the gospel preached by various men who were great preachers in that day, Whitfield and the Wesleys and others. God puts his people in all kinds of places, from the heights to the, the depths, to be his witness there, at work, at home, wherever. He's put each of us somewhere to be a light, to be a servant. The Shunammite woman was like that. She took an interest in Elisha. We read in verse 8 that there came a day when Elisha passed over to Shunam, and she persuaded him to eat food. By now, Elisha was known, a great public figure, the successor of Elijah, and she wanted to contribute to his ministry. She referred to him as the holy man of God. She realized that he would be passing through the region often, and so she proposed to her husband showing hospitality to Elisha. Verse 10, please let us make a, a little walled upper chamber and let us set a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand. And it shall be when he comes to us that he can turn in there. It was a generous offer and Elisha received it with gratitude. He, it's always interesting to see the response of the prophets and these prophets, Elijah and Elisha. Uh, e Elisha didn't presume that it was his right to have such a gift because he was poor and because he was God's servant. He was grateful for her kindness and he wanted to, to bless her and her husband with a gift. She was wealthy, and he, he didn't know if she had any uh, special, specific want or need. So he asked his servant Gehazi what would be appropriate. She didn't have any political needs. She didn't need an audience with the king, which e Elisha could have given her, or with anyone else of authority, or any kind of financial need. But... Gehazi said, she, truly, she has no son, and her husband is old. A son was important in Israelite society in order to maintain the family name and preserve the, uh, the title to the family inheritance, to the, the property that the family was allotted. So it was important to have a son, but uh, more than that, I think, it's just natural for the Shunammite woman to want a child, uh, to be a mother. But this was an older couple, and she had likely given up all hope of that long ago. And so when Gehazi went to her and called her, and she came to Elisha and, and stood in the door of his home, she had a hard time believing the good news that he gave her. Verse 16, at this season next year, you will embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. Now, of course, God cannot lie. And a prophet who speaks for God cannot lie. That's impossible. That's Titus chapter 1, verse 2, God cannot lie. It's repeated in, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. It's impossible for God to lie. His word is inviolable. And His promises are true and unbreakable. We can rest confidently in them. The Shunammite woman knew that. She wasn't questioning Elisha's character or God's word. This was an expression of astonishment at the good news. It seemed beyond belief. But it happened just as the prophet said it would. Verse 17, the woman conceived and bore a son at that season the next year as Elisha had said to her. That was the second 
act of mercy that we see in this passage. In the Beatitudes, in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now that's not a quid pro quo, getting something for something, performing a service in order to receive a service, doing something good in order to receive something good, getting mercy in exchange for mercy. Just the opposite. The Beatitudes describe the true nature of Christ's disciples, the nature of those who inherit the kingdom of God. And one of those characteristics is mercy. Mercy is defined differently in different places by different people, but I like this definition. Mercy is giving help to the helpless. A person must first receive mercy from God in order to be changed, and then as a result of this change, the new nature that the one who has received mercy from him has, he or she, being born again, shows mercy to others. Mercy produces the character in a person that shows mercy to people. That's, that's the gospel. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, while we were still helpless, when we could do nothing to save ourselves, when we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. Not those who clean up their act. He dies for the ungodly. He doesn't forgive and justify the one who works, the one who achieves, the one who merits, but the one who believes, the one who simply receives. So Christ wasn't saying a person should be merciful in order to receive mercy. The true disciple is merciful. And because he or she is, they receive mercy in life and at the final judgment. And the blessing produced by God in a disciple, a believer, is the great motivation for being helpful and showing mercy to others. Because we have been shown mercy, great mercy, we want to show mercy to those around us. That's a great characteristic of a believer in Christ. It's a great evidence of the new birth and new nature. Mercy. There are all kinds of things and characteristics that can impress us about people, intellect, wealth, a winsome, winning personality. But all of that can be used for selfish ends. Seems to me mercy is different from that. Fundamentally, it is kindness. It, is, it was characteristic of Christ. He went about doing good, Peter said. I love that statement. It's a, it, it's a, a, a simple statement that says so much. He went about doing good and, and far more than that. Having compassion on a helpless widow or giving or, or a grieving mother and giving blessing to them. There, there's nothing more impressive than that. It is selfless. It is to characterize us. Giving help to the helpless. It, it, it was the, the characteristic of this woman, the Shunammite woman. She was merciful because she loved the prophet and loved Elisha because she loved God. She loved the Lord. So it was natural that she wanted to bless him, support him, and be merciful, expecting nothing in return. But she got something in return, something great, a son, and we can be sure that that if we are living a transformed life, an obedient, godly life, a selfless life, the Lord will take care of us and bless us in every way and every day. Not to make us healthy, not to make us wealthy, and to give us everything we want. In fact, He may deprive us of what we want because it is not best but He will always give the faithful what is best for them, even if it is hard. He blessed her with what she wanted most, 
a son. It was a miracle. It wasn't a quid pro quo. But God blesses obedience. He blesses kindness. He blesses selflessness. He gave her a child. And the child grew to be a young boy and no doubt was the joy of the Shunammite and her husband. But unexpected blessing can lead to unforeseen sorrow. And that happened. The boy went out one day to help his father and the servants in the field during the harvest when suddenly he cried out to his father, my head, my head. His father told one of the servants to carry him to his mother. He was placed on her lap where a few hours later he died. It's hard to imagine the sorrow that she must have, have had at such a moment. <clears throat> My grandmother once told me many, many years ago about the death of her second son. His name was Sammy. He was four. He and my father were outside playing, and Sammy fell. He skinned his knee, got infected, he got tetanus, and he died. So he was my uncle who I never knew. She said, there is nothing harder for a mother than losing a child. You never get over it. And I'm sure that was so. But for this woman who, who lost a child she had never expected to have, the, the grief must have been overwhelming, puzzling as well. The blessing she was given and the hope that, that she had for her son was suddenly snatched away. Still, she didn't lose her faith. She placed his body in the prophet's room, then asked her husband for a, a servant, a donkey, that, and a donkey that she might go to Elisha. And he asked why. Uh, that seems like an odd question to ask. Evidently, she had said nothing to him about the child, or it may be that she had, and he's thinking, why? It's over. It's done. It's Lost, death is the end of everything. But she answered, it will be well. She was confident. She was confident, but not casual. There is a sense of urgency in her mission. We read in verse 24, Then she saddled a donkey and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Do not slow down the pace for me unless I tell you. She crossed the Jezreel Valley north to Mount Carmel where Elijah was who saw her coming and sent his servant Gehazi to meet her. When he asked, is it well with the child? She answered, it is well. One of the secular commentaries of this wrote, she says these words to Gehazi because she does not want to be detained and I can see his point, that, that makes some sense. But I say to that, no, these are the words of a woman of great faith. So firmly she believed that her boy would be raised. She was confident in that, that she could say it is well with the child. Just as Abraham believed that Isaac would have been raised from the dead if in Genesis 22 he had carried out that sacrifice of Isaac, which he fully intended to do. And I don't doubt that when the angel stayed his hand, it was just at that moment when he's about to plunge the knife into his beloved son, his only son, as he's called. And he could do that because, as the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews eleven nineteen, 19, he believed God would raise him from the dead. He had to because this was the child of promise and the whole History of God's people hung on that one boy. Now these, these are words of a woman of great faith. She firmly believed that her boy would be raised, just as Abraham did. And she came directly to Elisha. She fell down and took hold of his feet. And I think here 
If we haven't seen it in her at this point, we see the deep emotion that was in her heart. She falls down at his feet and holds on to him. Evidently, that was a breach of proper decorum because Gehazi tried to push her away. You think of those disciples trying to get rid of the children that, that the parents were giving to Jesus to be blessed. And he says, no, suffer the children to come to me. And Elisha stopped him. He saw her soul is troubled. Something happened and, and God had not revealed it to him. Now that reveals two things about a prophet. It reveals two things in general, and it, it reveals two things about Elisha in particular. He was not so enamored of himself and his importance that he was unapproachable or unaffected. He didn't care so much about decorum and, and respect as he did the soul of that woman. That made him perceptive. That made him sensitive. That made him insightful. He cared about her as the Lord did. He was God's representative. We see God reflected in the prophet. He's God's representative. And that's, that's the second thing. Again, it reveals that a prophet was only an agent of the Lord. He had no knowledge understanding or power in and of himself. It's all of God. So whenever a prophet spoke on his own, it was wrong. He's totally dependent upon the Lord for the revelation given. I think it reminds us of the importance of God's revelation. That's what we're to listen to. That's what we're to read. That's what we're to, to, to obey the revelation of God. And the prophet has nothing in and of himself. He's an empty vessel until he's filled with whatever God gives him, power or revelation. And God had not given him revelation about this. He'd not revealed this crisis to Elisha, so the Shunammite did. She did it carefully. She did it wisely. Verse 29, did I ask for a son from my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? In other words, was it a deception after all? Now, she was a woman of faith, if I, as I've said. She knew that could not be. God deceives no one. And she knew that her blessing would not end in the boy's death. And she is basically saying, change things. This cannot be. Her response was brief, a, a bit cryptic, but Elisha understood and took action to restore the blessing. He sent his servant on ahead of him, told him to run, let no one delay him, <clears throat> and, and lay Elisha's staff, his rod, on the boy's face. He did it without... He did it, but without effect. And so Gehazi then reported to him, the lad has not awakened. So Elisha entered the house, entered the room, and verse 32 states, Behold, the lad was dead and laid on his bed, which reinforced the fact for us that the child was, in fact, dead. What he was about to receive from the prophet was not CPR. He, he wouldn't be resuscitated. He would be brought back from the dead. But it required a process. When Elijah raised the widow of Zarephath's son, the result was more immediate. He stretched himself on the boy three times, prayed, and the boy lived. Here, a more involved method was required of Elisha. Verse 33. So he entered and shut the door behind him, behind them both, and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and laid and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands and stretched himself on him, and the flesh of the child became warm. Then he returned and walked in the house once back and forth, and went up and stretched himself on him, 
And the lad sneezed seven times, and the lad opened his eyes. He called Gehazi and said, Call this, this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she came in to him, he said, Take up your son. There was no set formula for these miracles that these prophets did. God deals with different people in different ways. And I don't know that we can say much more than that about this. But in both cases, what Elijah and Elisha, in, in, with both Elijah and Elisha, we see the, uh, the confident faith that both prophets had. Genuine faith and trust in the Lord is seen in perseverance. Continuing it in prayer when the answer or results are not immediate. So we must continue. We must persevere. That is the life of faith. That is often the test of faith. Will we persevere? Do we truly believe? The life of faith is one of perseverance, as we see here. But when the boy was raised up, his life restored, the Shunammite woman was called in. Elisha said, take up your son. And then we read in verse 37, then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground. And she took up her son and went out. It was a, a third miracle of mercy. And the greatest of the three, showing again that the Lord rules over life and even death itself. Nothing is too difficult for Him. The chapter, chapter ends with two more miracles in Gilgal, but these first three are examples of mercy and reveal the nature of true religion and the life of faith. God is sovereign, absolutely. We cannot stress that enough. God is sovereign. He determines the length of our days. That's Psalm 139, verse 16. In your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Our days are all numbered. The Lord decreed that from all eternity. That's what the Word says. That's not fatalism. And because He is sovereign, we pray not to change His will, but to change the circumstances so that His will will be accomplished. And so we do that according to His revelation. That's faith. It is active. And it acts with wisdom. It acts with caution. It acts with urgency to appropriate the means that God has given to do His will. There's more than one great theologian has said, the God who ordains the ends also ordains the means to the ends. It may be evangelism. That's the means that God has decreed and that He uses to call His elect out of darkness and into light and life. It may be Scripture, which God uses to sanctify us. We will not be sanctified apart from the Word of God. It produces in us growth, the means to the end. Or it's prayer. That's how we communicate with God. And He always responds with mercy to a prayer of faith. That's His great work, mercy. He is the God of all comfort. We can't separate Him from the one who we looked at last week who sent bears against boys who mocked the prophet. He is also just. He is a consuming fire, the Word of God tells us. But He did that, that judgment in the previous chapter, with restraint, with mercy involved. The work that God delights in it truly delights in is seen here. It is His love for His people. It's, it is mercy, mercy, mercy. From the one whom Jacob, Jacob called the God who answered me, answers me in the day of my distress. That is our God. The only God. 
We don't go to a prophet today. We don't go to an apostle to get an answer from him. We live in a different age and really in a more privileged position from the widow and the Shunammite woman. Our mediator is Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. He is the mediator between God and men. The only mediator, we are told in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Through Him, we go directly to the Father and to the throne of grace, where we receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so the great lesson of our passage is, go to the God who is our Father, the only God who is merciful, go to Him in prayer. Heaven has been opened up to us. We are invited to draw near with confidence, with boldness, day and night at any time, all times. The assurance we have is that the Lord hears and answers in the day of our distress or the day of our peace and prosperity. But He answers according to His wisdom and goodness to give to us what is best for us. It's not always what we want, but it's always what we need. The life of faith is trusting Him in the worst of times. Being faithful as the Shunammite woman was in her great test of faith. God blessed her. God answers big. He does more than we ask or think. He even makes tragedies into blessings. The widow and the Shunammite saw that. But even if we don't see that in our life and in our experience presently, faith perseveres in trusting in the Lord. Faith is what, is, is what lays hold of the great promises of God and knows that regardless of my circumstances, God is faithful to me and blesses me and will continue to do that. So, may God help us to persevere. Persevere presently because the day is coming when the trials will all be over, all tears wiped from our eyes, Heaven has not only been opened up for prayer, but for entrance and life, eternal life in God's house and glory. That's our destiny, and it's certain. Well, that is for believers in Jesus Christ, just as the privilege of prayer is for His people. Not only those who have put their faith in Christ as God and Savior are His people. So if you've not believed in Him, recognize your need of salvation. Realize that you are a sinner, separated from the Lord, guilty and in need of forgiveness. Trust in Christ. Trust in Him whose death has paid for our sins fully and completely and made peace with God. All who are forgiven, cleansed, declared righteous, and made sons and daughters of God are children of God forever with a glorious future. May God help you to come to Him. And you who have to rejoice in what you have in this life and what He's doing and trust in Him. Well, let's stand and sing number 47 in the Songs of Praise book. Oh, the love of my Redeemer and remain standing for the benediction. Hymn 47. Father, what a great truth to know and believe that we have a Redeemer who has purchased our forgiveness because He's washed our sins away in the blood of the Lamb. We thank You for Him. And thank You for the forgiveness we have and the life You've given us in this brief time in this world. May we live it faithfully. May we persevere confidently and victoriously to your glory. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In Christ's name, Amen.